The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. One of the key words that came up here was success, that these milestones are markers for success in adulthood. And they've been set somewhat arbitrarily. Then, later tonight. People say, well, you hate hockey. Why are you talking about this? I just want kids to play hockey and enjoy it and be protected. I love the game, certain aspects of the game, but it, it should be safe for people to come and play. Everyone has goals and milestones that they mark as life happens. Maybe it's graduation from school, first career job, marriage, children, and so on. Certainly, meeting such milestones can bring real satisfaction, but does not meeting them mean the reverse? Or is taking the road less traveled actually more common than ever in a world with shifting ideas about which milestones even matter? With us now for more on that. In Pitt Meadows, British Columbia, there's Paul Kershaw. He's the founder of Generation Squeeze, which is not just a think tank, but it's a self-described think and change tank. He's also a professor of public policy at the University of British Columbia. And here in our studio, Tony Serafini, associate professor in the Department of Sexuality, Marriage and Family Studies at the University of Waterloo. And Dave McGinn, columnist for The Globe and Mail. And it's great to have you two here with us in the studio. And uh, great to have you, Paul, in British Columbia with us again uh, for this program. I want to start by reading something that was on the BBC's website a couple of years ago, and that will kickstart our discussion here. As it turns out, these all-important deadlines are often arbitrary, and the pressure to achieve them sometimes comes from amorphous, unidentifiable places. They also aren't as set in stone as they may seem. From generation to generation, changes in technology and the economy, advances in science, and even the political climate can turn what once seemed like a social necessity into an antiquated expectation. Understanding where these expectations come from and how they differ from the reality we live in now is important for making personal milestones that are meaningful instead of clinging to outdated expectations. Okay, Paul, get us started here. The traditional deadline for life's milestones typically tend to be between the ages of 20 and 30. Can you give us some sense about how these expectations originated to begin with? Well, I think that these, de these timelines originated based on the sort of social practices of the day. You know, when people were coupling up, when people were completing school, when people landed a job, when did they get their secure housing, and uh, those established norms over time. And I think this conversation is bubbling up right now because the norms of the past few decades, especially when baby boomers started out, they are not today's norms. And they're not today's norms because hard work isn't paying off for a younger demographic as it's, it's starting into its adult years. And as a result, it's causing a range of delays in milestones that some decades ago we thought had become the norm. Well, let me follow up with Tony on that. Do you think the young people, for example, that you engage with at your university, do you think they judge themselves and their circumstances by their parents' milestone expectations? Well, Steve, I think that the milestone expectations go beyond their parents. They're getting reinforced in society, uh, even through their friends and extended uh, networks. So the pressure that students are feeling is real. They're very focused on, I need to get a good job. I need to be financially stable. They're thinking about the potential of coupling up, the potential of having kids and not having kids. So they're really grappling with, you know, what do I do next? And what does it mean to be an adult? And what does it mean to be me? They are thinking about all this at ages 18, 19, 20? Oh, absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Is that healthy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I would say it's healthy or not healthy, but these are the concerns of emerging adulthood, though, and that's the, the stage of life that they're in. Dave, let me get you in here because we've invited you here because you wrote a piece in the Globe and Mail mm -hmm. about the end of your marriage, which I got to say was, was extremely a beautiful piece and quite heartbreaking all at the same time. Yeah. And you said in that piece, the entire future I had taken for granted was suddenly gone. I wonder how all of that contributed to a sense of derailment in your life that the, again, the milestones that you had expected to live by were suddenly all askew. Oh, sure. Everything's just a blank page now, right? I mean, 
I think your big milestones from 20 to 30, like you said, are, you know, graduate school, mm -hmm. find a good paying job, get married, have kids, find a house, right? Let's say those are the big ones. But from 40 on, you know, I was living in the house that I thought I was gonna die in. I yeah. expected retirement and, and a plan, yeah. not even a plan, an assumed life had just suddenly vanished in the aftermath of my divorce, right? Now you have to, where am I gonna live? How are we gonna share the kids? What is my retirement going to look like? What is, what is my entire life going to look like? And, and that uncertainty, it's a scary thing to face. Was there any satisfaction in knowing that once you went public with your circumstances, you had a whole bunch of friends who said, oh, guess what? I feel your pain, brother. I've been oh, there too. Everyone, so many phone calls, <laughs> so many emails. And it goes back to the point of the story, which is how much men are, are reluctant often to talk about what's going on in their own lives. But certainly it's, it's comforting to have friends come out of the woodwork and say, hey, me too. Uh, there was even a period where, you know, I'm looking for housing in Toronto because I want to be here still in the city and maintain a certain continuity for my kids' lives. And me and another divorced dad were only half jokingly talking about living in an 80s sitcom where we would buy a house together <laughs> and he'd have his kids the week that I didn't and, you know, vice versa. Mm -hmm because that's just how sort of difficult that transition could be in this brave new world where none of the milestones you think are easy are, as, are easy anymore. How close did that come to actually happening? Um, too close for comfort. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Paul, why don't you come in here and tell us, uh, again, you deal with uh, young people, obviously, in, in uh, the course of your day with your university responsibilities and with your Think and Change tank. How much are today's young people, do you think, still influenced by the sort of old-fashioned strictures um, that were just outlined by our guests here? Well, it's, you know, it remains a part of the cultural context by which people judge whether or not they're being successful. I mean, one thing that Jen Squeeze had to do in our early days was help a younger demographic as they're starting into their adult years recognize that if they're struggling to establish a financial foundation, it's not because they're necessarily doing something individually wrong. It's because the way in which the economy and society has evolved has made their hard work pay off less, and we haven't used public policy to adapt all that urgently for them. And then when you take Dave's story, Dave's story is really interesting. Dave, you know, is sort of in, in midlife, but the moment that uh, a previous marriage breaks down and you have two individuals now having to start out again in a housing market, it's kind of replicating the experience of those in their early 20s who are trying to figure out how do I make a go of it as an individual in an economy which has really allowed home prices to decouple from what people can make from full-time work. And that is at the heart of eroding today's younger demographic in particular from being able to make the milestones of the past. And the question I think we need to ask ourselves is do we allow them to internalize that and then often sort of suffer a kind of anxiety, anxiousness, mental ill health because they feel like they're doing something wrong or failing? Or do we say, no, 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 it's something bigger going on, something systemic going on. Mm -hmm. And the problem's out here at the systems level that we need to fix, not something wrong with you individually. Well, Tony, how about that? Do, do, the, do the parents of the young people that you teach reinforce Force these milestones, and is there sort of disappointment expressed by parents if the kids are not meeting those milestones? Mm. I think one of the key words that came up here was success, that mm. these milestones are markers for success in adulthood. And they've been set somewhat arbitrarily. They're mm -hmm. certainly connected to the social situation of the day and the economic situation. Are parents reinforcing these milestones? Yeah, to a certain degree, absolutely they are. But again, young people are also getting very similar messages from other uh, folks in their circle as well. So it isn't just parents. Mm. And also remembering that parents and caregivers are on their own life journey mm. with their own milestones to meet. And depending on the strength of their parenting identity, seeing their kids be successful is important to their sense of self as a parent. So they're pretty invested in their kids' success. And of course, generally, people want the best for their kids, of right? Course. Paul, why do parents put that kind of pressure on their kids? I mean, they just have to look around to know that the way society is set up today, it's just nothing like it was 20, 30, 40 years ago when they were in similar circumstances. So why do they do it? Hmm, that's really an interesting question. No one's actually asked it to me quite that way before. I think 
I think one of the challenges right now for our, our aging populations that are reflecting on where they are relative to their, their adult kids is that the legacy that is being left for their kids isn't quite as strong as they might have liked. And so then we tell different stories to ourselves, you know, when we look in the mirror, our culture kind of reflects back to us. And, you know, I think of the, the bank of mom and dad as being a quintessential, you know, really harmful narrative in some ways for a younger demographic, but it does definitely make, the, you know, their, their parents who are thinking about retirement feel like, oh, you know, I'm continuing to have to, you know, pick up my kids and, you know, take care of them and continue to play this role as looking after them. My kids are infantilized. They need to go to adulting 101. And thank goodness the bank's <laughs> putting that on because if only they were better financial managers, that would be great. But I'm the bank of mom and dad rescuing them again. That is a very powerful narrative right now in society. And it kind of, I would say, risks letting off the hook an older demographic from asking some of the tougher questions. Like how on our watch did we tolerate public policies that allowed home prices to leave behind earnings. How on our watch have we tolerated our kids having to pay more for post-secondary and start with more student debt and then get creamed with really expensive childcare? How on our watch did we you know, allow climate change to create so much disruption in young people's lives where they can't count on the jobs of the past, they have to you know, eat differently, commute differently, holiday differently in order to fend off the worst that climate change has to offer. Those those are some of the big elephants in the room that I think culturally today's aging population wants to shy away from because those are parts of their legacy that are tougher to feel good about. And as a result, we then fall back into the habit of, you know, individualizing some of the challenges facing younger people and, you know, talk about they're eating too much avocado toast or drinking too many lattes. <laughs> and the, the public policy angle in that is really important. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, OK, Dave, let me get you on this. Did you take, I mean, on the one hand, we've talked about the handcuffs that some of these milestones represent, but mm -hmm. there's the other side of it, which is, did you take comfort in knowing as you grew up that, you know, by 18 or 19, I'm going to be at post-secondary, 22, 23, 24, going to have my first job, you know, get married at a certain age, house at a certain age. Did you yeah, take comfort in that? Of course, yeah. I think, I think this is the sort of two-sided coin of these milestones, right, is that one they provide a certain predictability to your life. And that predictability is comforting as long as they actually are predictable, right? Like you and I grew up knowing, or at least I grew up knowing, I will graduate from university in my early 20s. That university degree will afford a decent paying job that I can then you know, move up a career ladder. I'll be able to buy a house by the time I'm 30, 31, 32. Uh, I will get married, I will retire at 65, and it kind of plots out your life in a way that, that as long as you're achieving them and, and, and they are open to you and those opportunities are available to you, they provide a kind of map to your life that relieves a lot of anxiety that I think you might otherwise feel. Let me pick up on that anxiety. There's this thing that, um, well, all the kids are talking about it, you know, Tony, FOMO, right? FOMO, fear of missing out. FOMO. I just yeah. learned about this a few years ago. How is that affecting, in your judgment, based on what you see, how is that affecting the mental health of kids that you engage with these days? Oh, well, mental health, that's a really, really, really big topic. Mm -hmm. um, but I appreciate how having a plan and things um, falling into place around that plan can decrease anxiety. But what if they don't? Mm -hmm. What if you hit the age you thought you were going to get that job uh, and you didn't? and you're still looking. And even though you went to school, you're not able to get a job in your field, which is what I'm hearing from students, real concerns about what kind of job am I gonna get when I'm done? I mean, I had the same concerns many decades ago um, and you know, put some things in place, whatever made things happen. But I'm, I'm hearing that a lot with students, especially the senior students who are getting close to graduating. What am I gonna do? And in some ways, they're talking about echoing concerns of their parents, too. Well, you're going to go, what do you mean you don't have a job yet? You're going to graduate in a couple of months. What do you mean you don't have a job yet? Mm -hmm. Isn't this what university was for? Um, so shifting some of those expectations is going to be important to help support students' mental health, their wellness. Because those disappointments, they can be big, mm -hmm. and they can throw you right off track. Paul, what are you noticing about FOMO and whether or not it's affecting kids' mental health in an adverse way? Well, I, I see it all around me when I'm doing my teaching at the University of British Columbia. And 
And, and let's just be clear, it's not only fear of missing out, it's just, it's fear of the current circumstances. Yeah. You know, to go to grad school, increasingly students are relying on food banks and homeless shelters because, you know, being out of full-time work makes it so difficult to live in cities like Toronto and Vancouver and, you know, in Hamilton and in Kelowna. And so, you know, it's 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 not just the fear of missing out on what they might have imagined their parents' life could have offered them going forward. It's then experiencing the reality of that eroding financial security. And again, housing is just such, a, you know, it's such at the center of this. And I think there's a, to some degree, a bit of a bubbling up of anger amongst those, especially in the early thirties right now, like many people, you know, decent degrees, their, you know, Dave's story of landing good jobs, but, you know, doing it a decade or so later than Dave did and later than I did. And now that good job doesn't actually get you home ownership. It barely sometimes pays for secure rent. And then you're kind of more at the whim of, you know, your landlord. And often the landlord is going to be an older person who's invested in this home that you're now living in. It depends on when they're going to want to tap into the equity of that home for their retirement. And suddenly you're disrupted. At the moment, you're like, but I just had my baby and I wanted my baby to be able to go to this childcare for the next few years. But now we're disrupted all over again. And that lack of security financially is exacerbated by these moments where, you know, there's a lot of stressful things in the world right now. The climate change is identified as the greatest risk to human and economic health in the 21st century. And we face other issues around, you know, international strife and war. These things, I think, are contributing to a kind of cynicism setting in for a younger demographic. It doesn't matter. Like, what's this all about? And that then, I think, can feed into some other kind of coping strategies, which don't help people be as successful in today's challenging economy as we might otherwise like. In which case, Dave, do, does somebody have to say, or maybe do we all have to say, <clears throat> all of those milestones that maybe our generation grew up with, I'm ahead of you guys, but our, our collective generations, mm -hmm. do we just have to put those aside right now and throw at all the rules and say, look, it, you're, you, it, it's going to take longer for you to get to where your parents got to, and, and that's okay. So don't FOMO, you guys, just chill. Yeah, of course. I think I think when we look at all of those milestones, those were the results of social conditions of their era. And those social conditions no longer apply, right? To think that it should somehow be a norm that everyone could have a, a house who worked hard and, you know, quote unquote, played by the rules by 30, that's a fantasy now. It's, a, it's an unfortunate one, but it is. It's a fantasy now, right? The, the milestones, that we had for our previous generation no longer apply. And what we have to do is accept that, one, they don't longer apply. We have to look at a very, as you said, at a very political level and a policy level to understand why they don't apply and decide which, what sort of outcomes we want for a younger generation and what we're actually going to make happen for them. What's the average age of the students that you teach right now? They're between 17 and 22. Okay, so no one's talking about having kids yet, right? Some of them have plans they have to have families someday, and some are thinking about the fact that they will choose not to have families. Now that's someday. what I'm interested mm -hmm. in. Are some you're hearing some kids of that young age say yeah. it's not going to? This Absolutely. is not a part of my agenda. I used to teach a course, family, child, uh, parent relations, and um, in it we followed the child through the life cycle along with the caregivers. And students often talked about how they were really clear at that point. They they felt they knew at that point that they would not have children of their own. Why not? Lots of different reasons. Okay, hit, hit um, me with some. Like what? Um, you know, some just talked about parenting's not for me. That's not something that I want to do. Um, uh, I have older siblings who have children. I want to be an auntie or I want to be an uncle. I'm good with that. Did you um, ever hear cost? Ah, that's interesting. Uh, it's not standing out for me as one of the reasons, but I, I imagine that that, would, that could be a factor to some degree. Mm. Uh, some talk about, you know, I have a really clear academic plan in terms of uh, graduate school and in terms of what I want to do. Um, and kids and, are not part of that plan. Or I'll be too old huh. when I finish, um, and I wouldn't want to be an older parent, so I'm, I'm happier to just take this route. At least that's what they're talking about as they're, again, they're in that stage, emerging adulthood, where they're thinking about who do I want to be and what do I want to do in the future. And those decisions, sometimes they stick and sometimes they shift, right? But we need to respect them where they're at yeah. in their thinking. You've got kids. It's, did, I do, two did kids. It, did it ever occur to you as you were going through that journey that you would not have children? Or was it always a given? 
Uh, I think it was. I think it was mostly always a given. I mean, I didn't really think much about having kids until I was maybe 25, 26, kind of late 20s, and then I met who the woman who would eventually become my wife, and we fell in love, and we wanted to have kids, and and it never crossed my mind to not have kids. I was mm -hmm. I was in love and and lo love with the idea of having kids. Paul, I hear you. I think it's important to look at the data. Even British Columbia was the province that first lost control of home prices relative to earnings. And by no coincidence, it is the place where we've seen the highest average age of birthing in the country because more and more people and more and more women are delaying starting their families until they have a little bit more of some financial security but you can only delay so long because the biological clock is tick tocking and and um then we see as people are delaying you know our medical care system is having to pick up to some degree with some of the the consequences because bc is also not only the the highest average age of birthing but it has the highest rate of cesarean sections and that is the reality of you know having to ha make these adaptations at a at a species level like going from having kids in your early 20s to now you know almost a decade later a lot of the time that's a big adaptation at a species level in a remarkably short period of time when it comes to our reproduction and so I want to I want to ask Dave, you know, or, or engage with Dave, where he said, of course, the social conditions of the day set the norms that we were going to judge our success by, and we should no longer hold on to those because the social the social conditions have changed so much. But we need to acknowledge that, that is a major loss. Dave's made that point, but it's a major loss for that younger demographic following in our footsteps. That's asking them to give up a lot. Oh. And so I think it invites the really important question: What do we owe in return? How do we help the adaptation? It's not just that those of us who've come before, um, you know, can sit on the sidelines and say, well, we'll just watch these people struggle with the, you know, challenging social conditions that, by the way, happened on our watch, but not our problem. I think actually the fact that these are our kids and grandchildren, the people that we love, we ought to tap into that and, and think with some intergenerational solidarity, what do we do right now to help the adaptation and take some of the pressure off and the stigma off our kids and grandchildren and make sure that you know we don't let that FOMO and you know societal judgments about you're not meeting these expectations give rise not only to mental health but to financial insecurity. Well, I'm going to quote you back to you. Okay, Paul Kershaw, here's you writing in the Globe and Mail from last year in which you wrote, solutions can be found in public policy changes. Policy change requires younger generations and older folks who love them to contribute their voices and stories to changing cultural myths like the lazy millennial, altering political incentives like lower voter turnout among younger citizens, and signaling support for policy solutions by joining groups like Generation Squeeze. When enough individuals make these changes, we create political cover for politicians to respond bravely to fix intergenerational injustices. Can we get some ideas going here? Tony, why don't you start us off here? What do we need to do in terms of policy change in order that uh, this generation will not feel hamstrung by the typical milestones that we have placed in their Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not a policy uh, expert, uh, but one of the things that's always really dear to my heart is education and the cost of education. And it is unfathomable and, and disgusting to some degree that education in this country is so expensive. Um, it, what, what our policies reflect is the values that we have in this country. And when education is so expensive, that reflects a value around education. So access to education is limited. And... Okay, yeah, some say, wow, we've got OSAP, we've got this, we've got that. Let me tell you, paying back OSAP, no fun. And the rules have since changed, and you start um, accumulating interest on your loan before you even can begin working, um, making things really, really difficult for those who are trying to access education. So, I mean, one of the things for me would be, let's decrease the cost of education, let's make it more accessible to more who wish to go that route. Who are qualified to do so. Yeah, I mean, most high school kids, I mean, they can be, you know, supported to go on to post-secondary if they choose to, a college diploma, um, a university degree, even to have that experience of, um, well, shifting into adult roles, right? Having more responsibility, learning to think more critically, thinking outside the box in terms of what are the options. We want to change people's ideas and values about these milestones 
well, we encourage young people to think critically, to challenge the status quo, to, to move into policy change, for example. Mm -hmm. I use the word qualified because the province of Ontario has a policy that any qualified student will have a place somewhere in the post-secondary world of this province. Mm. Now, it's not to say that they'll get out of that experience debt-free, but it is to say that there's a spot for them somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. You want to throw an idea on the table here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Paul could speak to this much more I'm going to get to him. Don't worry. But I, I want him to have to sit through you two first. Oh, my. <laughs> to me, the, the, the centerpiece of this, the centerpiece of this idea of, of milestones in life is housing. Mm -hmm. That's, to me, the big one. The, your, your family planning probably revolves around a lot of that. Your, your economic stability is reflected a lot in that. And so, again, I'm no policy expert, but first and foremost, I think our priority should be establishing policies that make housing available and affordable to a lot more people than it is currently. To that end, I'm going to quote Generation Squeeze's information here. It took... 13, no, sorry, let me rephrase. Back in my day, it took five years to come up with a down payment for a home. Five years. Today, 13 years. Mm -hmm. So parents, your kids aren't lazy. Your kids are dealing with some economic realities here that we didn't have to deal with back in the day. So, okay, Paul, come on in here. Policy changes that would address that issue that Dave just raised, very important issue of actually being able to get into that first home. What do you see? Well, I think we need to acknowledge that our current national housing strategy hasn't been up to the task of, you know, c keeping home values connected to what local jobs pay. So I think we need a national housing strategy upgrade and NHS 2.0, we might describe it as. I think that we should take a step back from that and say every provincial and federal government ought to appoint a minister who has responsibility for intergenerational fairness. Hmm. And then that person could bring an all of government lens saying, you know, okay, when thinking about climate change, what are the intergenerational risks right now that we're taking on for younger people and future generations if we're not asking people to pay enough for their pollution? Or on the housing side, you know, have, have people like me who live in Metro Vancouver, have I extracted so much wealth out of the housing system that I'm contributing to leaving less affordability for those who follow? And if so, what might I be asked to do to help, you know, contribute to a solution? And we are going to need to have a conversation with our aging loved ones and our families because to some degree, the reason that you know post-secondary is more expensive now than in the past, that we're still you know, not urgent enough investing in childcare and you know, having a better parental leave program, let's say, is because so many of our tax dollars are being used to invest later in the life course right now as our baby boomer population is aging. And there is a, there is a difficult conversation to have with that part of our demographic, with those members of our family to say, yes, you worked very hard Hard over your your working lives, you've raised us, you've invested in us. Thank you very much. But as a generation, you haven't paid enough taxes for the medical care and the old age security on which you are now counting. We want you to have that, but we need to figure out how to ask your generation, especially the affluent members of your generation, to contribute enough to cover those those costs, so we don't even leave larger deficits and debts for your kids and grandchildren via unpaid bills, which is only going to exacerbate the struggles they have going to school longer to land, jobs to pay less, to then face home prices that are so much higher, and then they are delaying starting their families, but they can only delay so long, and they're caught in this economic vice grip. Well, Dave, I have heard boomers say this problem is going to solve itself because when we die, you're going to inherit all our money and our homes, and you'll be fine. How's that for a solution? I don't think when we die, everything will be okay is a plan to get out of any trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Tony? I don't feel comforted. <laughs> what did I you don't say? feel comforted. <laughs> no. no. But there is a certain, I mean, there is a certain, as, as macabre as it sounds, there's a certain economic truth in what I just said. Well, it's a hierarchical truth, though, <laughs> because not all baby boomers are in a position where they have equity of that nature to leave behind to their kids. Yeah. So, you know, it's a dual system here. Are we really thinking about everyone, or are we continuing to think about, you know, those in a particular social status, right? Cool. Paul, we've, we've talked about this before, the fact that I I'm not sure... Uh how brave a politician, well, I am sure. You'd have to be an incredibly brave politician to run on a platform of, I'm going to tax the people who actually vote in disproportionate numbers to their share of the population more so that we can take better care and give a better break to those in the population uh, who disproportionately vote less and who most older people think are whiners and complainers anyway. That would be a very brave politician to run on that platform. So how do you see this actually happening? 
Well, twofold. I'm going to rip off from every automobile the bumper stickers that say I'm spending my kids' inheritance. <laughs> and then I think actually I'm going to emphasize more that there is love between older and younger Canadians in this country. Um, parents love their kids and grandchildren and grandchildren love their grandparents. And I think we need to tap into that as the cornerstone for building intergenerational solidarity, not only around our holiday family tables, but in the world of politics, because that can then give the political cover for the politicians to bravely respond to the data that show there are pressures on an aging population. But there are also pressures that are being left by that aging population to their kids and grandchildren. Both of them need to be addressed. We can do both, but we need to you know, prioritize a conversation about intergenerational fairness that asks those of us who are older, myself included now, I'm much older than when I started Gen Squeeze, to reflect on what is the legacy that we are leaving. And parts of that legacy are not nearly as strong and there's time for us to fix that. I think there are enough older Canadians who are keen to be feeling proud about what they're leaving for their kids and grandchildren. Who doesn't want it to be better for those who are following in our footsteps? And that, I think, can pave the pathway for any political party to win an election that says, I want to make this country work for all generations. We're going to give the guy from the left coast the last word on this. And even though he's on the right of the screen, he's actually the furthest west of us right now. That's Paul Kershaw from Generation Squeeze and the University of British Columbia. Dave McGinn in the middle there. You can read his columns in the Globe and Mail. Tony Serafini, Associate Professor in the Department of Sexuality, Marriage and Family Studies at the University of Waterloo. Thanks to the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight. Great discussion, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hockey may be Canada's game, but some really ugly stuff has come out over the past few years about hockey culture that doesn't make anyone proud. Justin Davis considered himself lucky to rise through the ranks all the way to play professionally, but after he'd finished his run in the game, he came to see it quite differently. He writes about that in his new book. It's called Conflicted Scars, An Average Player's Journey to the NHL. And Justin Davis joins us now. I know, first of all, welcome. It's great to meet you. Great to have you here. Glad to be here. The, the first thing I thought of when I saw the subtitle of your book is, you know, you are not an average player. You know that, right? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you're taught to be humble when you play. So the higher the level you get, you realize maybe you weren't as good as the other players. So you see yourself as that player and you don't recognize that you may be better than the other. You may be? Justin. You may be better than the Justin, other. Justin, you're one of the top, even though you were not Wayne Gretzky, right. you are one of the top like point zero 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 one best percent best players in the world. You are. Yeah, and I, I guess the book's here to remind me of that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely been a journey. Here is what you write in the book, and I must confess, I have read a lot of hockey books, and I have never read a line like this before. You write, the truth is, I think I hate hockey. I hated hockey at many points when I played. I hated it at the end of my career, and I think I hate it now. The game of hockey is broken. It leaves scars inside us. We keep hidden. And only now am I ready to talk about it. You are how old? 44. How come only now? I think when you evaluate yourself as you get older, I think you bury a lot of things inside. And uh, as my son started to come the age that I, 16, 17, when I went through a lot of the stuff that I buried deep inside, I realized that uh, the reason I carry so much weight and anxiety and bouts of depression and my body hurts when I wake up is because of hockey. And uh, even though it gave me uh, the profile and and the fame at times that it did, I hate the fact what it's done to me and where, I, where I'm going through some things I'm going through right now. Even with all of, and we will get into some of the details. I read the book. It's quite, it's shocking what you've been through. Any concerns about saying out loud what you have said out loud in this book? Oh, of course. I mean, when I wrote it, it was like, you're always taught what's said in the room stays in the room. So when I wrote the book, it was initially just to my kids and uh, so that they knew who their dad was in case uh, memory issues kept popping up along the way. And you got three kids, two teenagers and one who's almost a teenager. Yep, you got it. Yeah. And uh, so a story to them that I thought nobody would see. And in 15 years, maybe we pull it out of the drawer and I give it to them. And uh, uh, so, of course, there's a fear as soon as someone says, we're going to publish this and people are going to read about your life. I'm a teacher. So when I walk down the <laughs> hall, uh, kids I teach know some of the 
kind of the horrors kind of or things that I grew up with and some of the things that I've done. But uh, uh, the feedback's been fantastic and teammates has always been supporting and, uh, and I've had a great avenue just to talk. I had a lot of teachers back in the day. I don't remember any who were 6'4", 2", how much you weigh? Well, we'll say 220, we'll be generous. 6'4", 220. But anyway, there are, I mean, let's face it, there are a lot of people who have experienced in the game what you experienced. Um, not just the bullying, not just the hazing, not just the, uh, the difficulties dealing with coaches, uh, not just the sort of, it didn't work out, you know, some things the way you'd hoped. But they don't say out loud they hate hockey. Why do you think your experience might be different from theirs? I think I just hit a point where I'm just comfortable with who I am. Um, I got together last Friday night for, for wings with a couple former teammates and we had no problem sitting around the room talking about some great stories and things that happened and the book's been a great uh, avenue for us to, to talk about the bad things that happened. So now we're talking about that behind closed doors and, and uh, it's opened up some eyes of what happened to us. So I think it's been good that way and people are just starting to talk. But I think we're all afraid to expose things. And uh, I mean, I said I'm 44 years old and I talk about a coach in the book and, uh, and I got a phone call from him wanting to talk about some things that had been written. And Is this one of the coaches you named or didn't name? I didn't name, but I mean, I sat there as a 44 year old, three kids and a teacher and I was afraid to take the phone call hmm. because I still kind of had that fear inside me. So when we talk about why, do we, why we don't talk, I think we're still under, uh, feel like we're under control of some of these people and it's only now that, that we're starting to feel comfortable with ourselves. Well, let's go back and tell a bit of the story and then people will get a better understanding of why your feelings about hockey are so mixed these days. You were, it started I guess in Flamborough. Yes. You, were a, you were a phenomenal hockey player. You were scoring 200 plus points in seasons with 50 games. I mean, it was crazy racking up scoring records amazingly and yet you said everybody hated you why did they hate you uh, times were different back then where small town people played hockey in small towns our parents didn't drive us uh, 100 kilometers to a practice and didn't have nhl dreams when we were five or six so uh where i might now be playing triple a hockey i was playing single a hockey and in and scoring and scoring and scoring and I think parents are always jealous that either their son isn't doing the same things or that you're selfish and they want to bring you down to their level. So Parents on the other teams? My own team and other teams. I remember I talk in the book about uh, even at the age of five or six, walking out of the arena with my head down or winning an MVP of a game and putting it in my bag and just trying to walk out to the car and meeting my parents there just because uh, you're embarrassed or you just don't want to interact with people in the lobby. and. Then I thought that was normal and looking back, like I said, my own kid coming out of the arena, you just realize how naive you were to everything and, uh, and it is a huge chapter in my life on uh, things I'm dealing with even to this day. When you're a five-year-old kid and you look up in the stands and you see a hockey mom giving you two birds <laughs> and frothing at the mouth swearing at you, what goes through your mind? Well, I think you're just wondering first what's wrong with the person and why are they so <laughs> angry, but I mean, you go to, you go to sporting events now and you still go to minor hockey and there's some people that have lost a lot of perspective on, uh, on the game and, and why their kid is there. How much of the fact, how much of the broken aspects of hockey today would you lay at the feet of parents who just really don't understand that this is supposed to be a fun game for kids? Yeah, I think, I mean, the majority of it, and I think the majority of these people are people who have never played the game, have never played the game at a high level, so they feel like their coach or their parents didn't put enough money in and their kid's going to be the next one. And, and the more money they put in, the more time and the more probably going to become Connor McDavid. But these are generational players. And I talk all the time about the best part of hockey should be driving in the car with your kids and stopping for a milkshake or a burger after the game or having conversations that you, know, you normally don't have. I mean, I have a 17-year-old son. If it wasn't for sports, I wouldn't spend... 10 hours a week with them in the car, but that's something that we have. And um, if they make it, they make it. But if not, I mean, it's a relationship you get to have with your kids. I remember Brandon Shanahan once telling the story about how when his dad dropped him off at games, his dad would sit up on the very top row and read the paper during the games. And Brendan, I think at the time thought, why isn't he interested? And then with the benefit of hindsight realized, actually that was exactly the right approach to take. Make sense? Yeah, and I said in the foreword of the book, like, I apologize that I'm the guy sitting by myself all the time. And, 
but I just want to watch them play and I don't want to get caught up in the other stuff. And I laughed. My dad, when I played junior hockey, he used to stand in the same spot and he stood by himself, but I knew if I wasn't playing well and I looked up in the second period, sometimes he'd be gone. <laughs> and uh, I remember him telling me that I knew if he didn't have a good first couple of periods, it wasn't worth staying for the third period. So <laughs> he meant well, but uh, there's obviously a different side too. Let's talk hazing. Yeah. Uh, a real curtain has been pulled back on the whole hazing thing. These initiations that uh, a lot of teams put their, I guess, particularly rookies through. For those who don't follow this stuff, give us an example of some of the crap you went through. Well, I think from early ages, I played junior C, junior B, junior A, and OHL hockey. So each year I got initiated. Uh, everything was from the basics of getting your head shaved, your entire body being shaved. Um, it seemed that when you're looking back on it, everything involved nudity or um, walking around naked or different things happening. And I think the one component most people talk about is a hot box that used to happen in uh, major junior hockey where uh, all the rookies would strip down at the same time, walk to the back of the bus, and they'd stand in uh, the bus bathroom with the heat on, and uh, they'd go 10, 20, 30 minutes to hour to two hours in the bus bathroom. And uh, when there's a knock on the door, you could come out. So. Uh, stuff like that was cyclical and you didn't realize it, it was a badge of honor you thought that everybody did that but looking back on it you realize just <laughs> how crazy that was looking back on it I mean I guess it was that it's it's one of these teams that everybody participate one of these things everybody participates in and it builds team spirit did it ever do that in your experience no, I think, if anything, it, it might have made you feel closer to the guys that were in the bathroom with you, but, and you thought it was this badge of honor, but looking back, I mean, there's other things that could have happened that uh, would have provided the same avenue. And my son plays baseball for one of the, the top uh, baseball team in the province, the Great Lake Canadians out of London. And I drop him off as a 17-year-old and I don't think of him being bullied or being in a bus bathroom or being hazed. And these are eight coaches that teach character and integrity. And so then I look back on that and think, why would I be afraid to drop them off at a hockey game? Or why were these things happening to me? And you realize hockey is just its own sport and it's these traditions that have been passed on. No 17 year old thinks to themselves, we should stick six people in the bathroom or we should make them run around naked. These are just things that have been passed on uh, through decades. Is hazing out of the game now to the best of your knowledge? I would say at the higher levels, the CHL has really tried to take out the, the terrible uh, aspects of it. But in the Alberta Junior Hockey League this past year, uh, a captain and assistant were suspended for 14 games for uh, hazing stuff going on. And that's what I worry about the lower levels of things, double A hockey, triple A hockey, junior C, junior B. And uh, I think it's still going on. And, and these are, are things that People say, well, you hate hockey. Why are you talking about this? I just want kids to play hockey and enjoy it mm -hmm. and be protected. I love the game, certain aspects of the game, but it, it should be safe for people to come and play. I'm going to share some numbers with you and our viewers here. In 2021, surveys found that 41% of families in all the major junior hockey leagues in Canada, CHL, say there's a problem with harassment in the game, 41%, compared to 19% of general managers feeling the same way. Two more numbers. 24% of those surveyed said there's a problem with discrimination in the game. 24. Only 16% of general managers thought there was. That's a reality gap. Why does that gap exist? Well, I think it's, it's easy for the people involved to see that there's an issue. But when you're in control of the game, like we have people that run teams that are the coaches and general managers of a team. So if you have an issue, you report it to the coach. Well, sometimes that coach is the general manager and everybody's tied in. So it's easy for them to say there isn't a problem because as a player, I never really felt comfortable going to my coach and saying, I would never say, oh, so-and-so bullied me or this was happening because they say, uh, we would trade you. So I think that's the issue. And that's the issue that you see in those statistics. And a lot of that's from the Turnpenny report that was released in 2018. And the CHL tried to bury that report. And they would only report about things that happened from uh, after 2016 or 2018 when they did the report. Mm -hmm. So we're not even diving into 2010, 2012, or 2003, or way back. So these are, these are current numbers, and those numbers are even protected. Turnpenny is Rachel Turnpenny, who's a yeah. Toronto lawyer who gets called in to investigate some of these situations from mm -hmm. time to time. Let's talk a bit about, uh, okay, your junior career, Kingston Frontenacs, Ontario Hockey League. 
great team, great league. A lot of, not a lot, but a certain percentage of folks from that uh, league go on to play in the National Hockey League. You got drafted in 1996 by the Washington Capitals. 85th pick, what was that, third round? Uh, I think it was fourth round then. Fourth yeah. round? Yeah. Sedano Chara was in the third round. Yeah. So same year as the Big Z. You looked like you were on your way to the NHL. What happened to make it take a turn for the worse? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, sometimes you show up and you realize maybe you're not good enough and you see other players and uh, playing in the Canadian Hockey League, you think it's a be-all, end-all, but then you show up to training camp and there's uh, people from Finland and Sweden and players you never heard of that were that were really good. But for me, my problem was I... Uh, I had a major concussion the year before, the year after the, the draft, and uh, I had a minor scrape of the law that was uh, uh, something that never should have happened, but it happened. And it seems like anything the bad that could have happened happened the year after uh, I got drafted and uh, uh, was not something you'd want after being picked. Okay, the minor scrape at the law was kind <laughs> of, a, it's actually a very funny story. It's in the book. I won't ruin it for those who want to buy the book. Uh, but, but the concussion is serious business. Tell us how that concussion happened and how the team you played for at the time handled it. Uh, we were playing game, I was playing for the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds and uh, we were playing in Detroit. I took a, a late hit against the boards and uh, I was unconscious on the ice and I had a fencing response. So if anyone watched Miami Dolphins uh, game last year, their quarterback, it's where your hands kind of go stiff. And uh, I was unconscious for two or three minutes on the ice. I was taken to the training room where I came to and then I was put on the bus. Uh, on the bus, I was throwing up everywhere and, uh, and in and out of consciousness. And they were trying to sneak me across to Canada because they didn't want to pay the U.S. medical bills. And uh, the trainer finally, uh, the last time I threw up, said we need to get him to the hospital. And they dropped me off to the hospital and I got a CT scan. I had major bleeding on the brain, was rushed to uh, intensive care. And I was left there by myself in intensive care. And the bus continued home to Sault Ste. Marie and my mom ended up driving uh, that night to join me and uh, after the fact after I was in there for three or four days and returned home uh, I was given the bill uh, given the bill for the CT scans and the care in the US and was told that uh, my contract in the OHL did not cover uh, US medical expenses was it 17 grand the bill yeah 17 grand and uh, and my parents contact my agent, Alan Walsh, who's a well-known agent that takes care of his players. And he told them that that's fine, we'll pay the bill, but uh, we'll let everybody know how you take care of your players. I mean, that's shocking, isn't it? Yeah, and I think at the time you're, you talked earlier about, are you afraid to speak up? I think even at the time, I, I was afraid for my parents to speak up and I wanted them to pay the $16,000 because mm -hmm. I didn't want to lose my spot in the team and be the guy that's uh, a problem in the dressing room. But looking back on it now, I mean, they promise all these things, and then here's someone that won't even take care of your medical bills. In your third year in the Ontario Hockey League, you're playing for the Sioux, you got a new coach, and you write, if I had to choose one coach not to emulate in any way, it would be him. You want to name him? No. I'm not naming him right now, but I will say that uh, we've talked this past year, and he's reached out, and he's opened... I think my eyes to some things that were going on behind the scenes with the general manager and uh, the general manager at the time, uh, Dave Mayville wasn't, was, I feel like was the root of a lot of that was going on. And mm -hmm. he was a newer coach that things happened with him and he's apologized. And I think to have the, this many years later to reach out and being a high profile coach, I'm actually happy he did that. But uh, realizing now there's some things behind the scenes and things that I wished weren't true were actually true in the way that I was treated and uh, and uh, you just wish some people would be called to task for some of the things that they did. One of the things I was happy to read about in the book is that the greatest junior coach of all time, <laughs> Brian Killer Kilray, actually knew of you when you were in the Sioux, decided to trade for you because he said, I think I can turn him into something. He always played well against us. Yeah. I think I can turn him into something. And... And it worked out. You had a great run with Killer Kill Ray's Ottawa 67s. What made it great? It was the first time you were treated as a human being. So I remember when he traded for me, he waited for me in the dressing room and said, you're coming back with me. And uh, I lived at his house with him for, for two or three days. And uh, I, though he's this boisterous, loud guy, if you made a mistake, um, he'd yell at you from across the ice and he'd take that sneaky like little path so the fans couldn't really see and try and sneak in the bench. But after the game, when you thought he hated you or that you made the worst mistake ever, he'd ask how your parents were doing and 
he'd say, uh, here's some gas money for the way home, and he'd actually ask how you're doing. So it was the first time it seemed simple where he treated me as a human being, and he let us play. We were in the same practice every day for two years, but it was high-paced, and it was just creativity was, um, was expected, and uh, he let us play hockey. What's the story about him saying to one of his players, if I beat you out on the ice, all these guys are going to have... Go ahead, you know the one I'm referring to. Yeah, I mean, his best line is, my favorite line is, he'd look at you and say, uh, uh, Davis, I don't know if you're playing right wing for us or left wing for them. <laughs> that used to be, uh, and I still use that coaching now. But uh, yeah, we are, one of the guys was late for practice one day, and I remember uh, Ryan Kilroy, probably 65 years old, 70 years old at the time, said, if, uh, if I beat you out on the ice before you get dressed, then the whole team's skating. And I just remember him going into his office and, uh, and coming out about... 20 seconds later with just a hat and a whistle and his skates on his gloves saying, I beat you, we're skating, and just that little chuckle that he'd have. And uh, he was just such a funny guy, and it felt like you're being coached by your grandfather. Hat, gloves, stick, whistle, skates, and nothing else. No, just Brian Kilroy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, all right, let's do this. We started with a quote about you um, really not liking hockey, hating hockey. But then through playing for Killer Kilray, and then after that you went to the University of Western Ontario, as it then was, now Western University. You won a Memorial Cup with Kilray. You won a university championship at Western. Did all of that rekindle some love of the game for you? Yeah, for sure. I remember that. Um, I remember that last year in Ottawa when we won the Memorial Cup. I just remember I had the opportunity to assist on the game-winning goal, and I just remember walking to a bathroom stall in the dressing room and just sitting there by myself in my equipment and just kind of tears flowing just I mean you have the joy of winning but it was just seeing all the things that you'd been through and just that joy of playing hockey again was brought back and uh, and then that led me going to Western I realized the hockey world and uh, I could play professionally after but if I got my education and did that and surrounded by Clark Singer and just a great program at Western it I left there and I just realized why I why I love the game and the whole book is there's a love hate relationship with it now you, you you sort of threw that away there you assisted on the Memorial Cup winning goal in triple overtime that one was uh, it was the first overtime. First overtime. And then at Western we won in triple overtime. Okay, so you had some pretty dramatic exciting yeah. moments there. Yeah. And I see you're smiling, so you still love them. Well, those are the good moments. Being hockey, I, I love those moments, and those teammates are, are some of my best friends and moments I'll never forget. You also talked in the book about how you got that scar on your upper lip, and I must confess, when you described it in the book, I thought, that's pretty gross, but I'm sure you got a good plastic surgeon, and you, know, <laughs> you probably can't even see it anymore. I got news for you, Justin. I can see it. <laughs> you, you've got a good souvenir from your playing tapes there, right? Oh, don't tell my mom. My mom's been on me for about 20 years to get that fixed, but uh, the book's called Conflicted Scars, and that's one of the outward scars that uh, is a part of me. You've got a quote in here from Jamie McLennan, uh, who's TSN, formerly a, a goalie, who said, hockey is 95% amazing, but the 5%. There are serious issues there, and they have to be dealt with. What's the biggest obstacle to getting that 5% that's a problem dealt with? I think it's diversity in the game. I think it's, you look at coaching, it's the same coaches that get recycled, it's the same general managers that get recycled, people get fired, people get hired, and it's the same way of thinking. Um, there's, uh, there's females getting hired now in, in front offices and in coaching staffs, and, which is great. It, it's a different aspect for people. People that didn't play the hockey, didn't play hockey at a high level, that understand the game and understand different numbers. And that's, that's a huge change for it. And then they can look from the outside. I remember telling stories in my uh, staff room, I'm a teacher, and uh, telling stories to some of the people that I work with and them just looking at me and thinking that's the craziest thing they've ever heard. But in a hockey room and the people I hang out with, those are normal stories. So I think when I say diversity and different uh, voices, uh, I think that changes things so people don't realize the things that we view as being normal. Um, they realize that they're very abnormal. You won a championship, the Memorial Cup, which is junior... You won a championship with Western in the university hockey. You won the Allen Cup, which is a championship for senior men's hockey. So you've had some, you've had your share of success. And you played in Germany, too. You yeah. played overseas as well, made some money playing over there. My question is, is there a part of you today that wishes 
I wish I had a cup of coffee in the NHL. There was a time where I said I would have done anything for it, but I have friends that played a game or two or played two seasons in the NHL, and I see where their life has taken them and the relationship with their, their family. And, I mean, if I could have played, great. But, I mean, I've been married for over 20 years. I've got three great kids. I love my job teaching where I teach. And uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't throw anything away that's happened. And I think... We're all meant to be. There's a purpose to our life why we're in certain places. And when I look back at my career, even why, even how I'm here talking to you and I've written a book, I think without the bad things being happened and me being more successful maybe in hockey, I wouldn't have the voice that I have uh, to talk right now and see some change in the game. That's true, and I don't mean to be a mercenary about this, but what did you get paid to play in Germany the last year you were there? Uh, I think we were about... 4,000 euros a, a month, which, uh, which was good for paying off my student debt. But the good thing about Germany is you don't pay for anything once you're there. So everything's covered. And the best part about going is you only play two games a week. So okay. travel is limited. I get that. But you know, had you played even one season in the NHL, you'd have made three quarters of a million dollars as the lowest salary you could have made. Right. But then you see that when you make the million dollars, you buy the million dollar suits and the million dollar cars. I mean, I... Uh, guys I played with that got minimal bonuses and were buying Land Rovers and expensive suits, and I learned to be a thousandaire from a young age. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, the, the book was a, a terrific read, and you've got some really important things to say in there, so I'm glad you said them. Conflicted Scars, An Average Player's Journey to the NHL. Justin Davis. Thanks, Justin. Perfect. Thank you. Tomorrow on the agenda. Democracy and democratization is incentive compatible with these regimes. It makes sense. It's, it, it's, with, it's in their self-interest to democratize from a position of strength. And so China is, a, is what we call a prime candidate. Also, tomorrow on the agenda. Today's uh, best AI systems don't experience much, but we have to be humble and, and acknowledge that we don't know that for sure. That's tomorrow on the agenda.